everyone, and welcome to San Jose City Hall. On behalf of the City of San Jose, I would like to welcome you. Uh, we have, I think, a terrific program this morning. Uh, we have uh, representatives from U.S. Customs and Border Protection with us. We have the Foreign Trade Zones Board in Washington with us. They traveled specifically to San Jose today to participate in our program, uh, which is, I think, the first time certainly we've experienced that. We have several of our Foreign Trade Zone operators here. We have several uh, economic development uh, officials from neighboring cities which are part of the San Jose Foreign Trade Zone here. So we're thrilled to have them here as well. Um, the Foreign Trade Zone program is one of the nation's earliest economic development initiatives and also a program that enhances trade and manufacturing in the United States. Uh, it is a program that enhances the global competitiveness of companies that are operating in the United States, both US-owned companies and foreign-owned companies. Um, this morning, we will hear from Elizabeth Whiteman of the Foreign Trade Zones Board. Uh, Liz will provide a detailed overview of the Foreign Trade Zone program and also provide you with information about the role of the Foreign Trade Zones Board. Uh, following Liz's presentation, Joanne Valit will provide a presentation about the programs and services that the U.S. Commercial Office provides to businesses in San Jose. Uh, following Joanne's presentation, I will provide a very brief overview of the role of the grantee uh, in the Foreign Trade Zone program and um, also provide uh, information about Foreign Trade Zone number 18. Um, following that, we will hear directly from uh, several companies that are operating as foreign trade zones. Um, I will ask them a series of questions. Uh, we welcome your questions and comments. Uh, and then following the panel session, we will hear from John McKenzie, uh, a leading trade authority, talking uh, about some current trade issues that are impacting the United States. He will provide a personal um, perspective and insight to us. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, we will hold the questions of the speakers until the end of the program with the exception of the panel members. So with that, I would like to provide a brief introduction of our first speaker, Elizabeth Whiteman. Uh, Liz is a senior analyst at the Foreign Trade Zones Board in Washington. She joined the board as an economist back in 1998, um, and she has reviewed a number of foreign trade zone applications uh, working in manufacturing. Um, her uh, responsibilities include monitoring uh, foreign trade zone activity nationwide, uh, outreach and education uh, to the trade and other government agencies, and she prepares the board's annual report uh, to Congress. And uh, the city and each of our operators know the importance of that report, and uh, we'll be preparing that report just within the next few months. Um, she's also the board's representative to U.S. Customs and Border Protection on ACE, which is the new uh, CBP um, automated system. And finally, uh, if that's not enough, Liz is the primary Foreign Trade Zones Board representative uh, representing uh, Foreign Trade Zone grantees and operators in the Midwest, which is a very um, uh, high demand profile as well. So with that, I would like to welcome Liz to San Jose. So thank you for inviting me to the West Coast anyway. <laughs> Actually, there is somebody on our staff who is um, dedicated to your region, and unfortunately he is out of town and couldn't make this event. Um, but I will give you his contact information. But uh, you know, of course, at any time in the future, I'm not going to call you, or I'm not going to hang up if you call me either. So <laughs> we, we are a small staff. But um, welcome today, and thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to dive right in, because we actually have a lot to cover, and there's a lot of interesting information after this also. So what are the basics? FTZ, the FTZ program actually goes back to 1934, as Joe said. It, it, was, um, it was during the New Deal. Um, of course, there was a lot going on with tariffs and whatnot at that point, and this was a, a, a means that Congress sought to really encourage activity, employment, and eventually manufacturing here in the United States. So the program actually is quite a history. Um, essentially what it is, a foreign trade zone is a place that's designated by the Foreign Trade Zones Board, activated by U.S. Customs and Border Protection. We'll get into what that means in a little bit. But it's, it's really a specific location here in the U.S. where different customs procedures can be used. And those customs procedures mean that you can really delay the customs entry 
on merchandise. That's the quick summary. We're going to get into what that means, possibly for you as a company, in terms of duties uh, and, and the potential savings that it could involve. But essentially, that's all it is. It's a place here in the US where special customs procedures can be used. The idea behind the program initially, and in, in 1934 and still now, was to encourage activity and investment employment here in the US that could otherwise be done abroad for customs reasons. And it's really, I mean, that was the original purpose. That's still what we're trying to do today. So, so we kind of summarized, and we're, we are going to get into the details of each of these. But FDZ procedures allow activity here in the United States. And to, first of all, to um, I don't want to, anyone to get the, the wrong impression. Foreign trade zones are very much a part of the United States. Merchandise that goes into a foreign trade zone has not been entered for consumption, but it has been imported into the US. So these are locations here in the US, but once again, simply where special customs procedures can be used. You can defer that customs entry. US FTZs are very much, though, within the territory of the US and subject to all other federal, state, and local laws. So some of you might have heard about, uh, say, for example, free trade zone programs in other countries where there may be different labor laws or different uh, tax laws that apply. And um, so I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that is not the case here in the US. Uh, it, really, it really is simply about the customs procedures, the timing of the customs entry. But all other federal, state, and local laws do apply. So I hope nobody gets up and walks out right now. <laughs> but, but it is an important point. And it's a common misunderstanding that people think a foreign trade zone is, say, outside of the US somehow or you know, outside of, of, of an agency's jurisdiction. So we're gonna, we will talk about the benefits, don't worry, but I want to get that out there up front, that this really is about the timing of the customs entry. So before a company can actually use the FTZ, you know, I mentioned before that FTZs are locations designated by the FTZ board. So that's step one. Before the FTZ can be used, it has to go through a process of activation with US Customs and Border Protection. So step one, get it designated. Step two, activate with US Customs. Custom CBP is actually the, the agency that involved in the day-to-day -day oversight of the FTZ activity. My office has the very lucky position of dealing with the theoretical. <laughs> you can have an FTZ here. You can do this type of activity. But we're not the ones on the ground handling the day-to-day -day oversight. That's US Customs and Border Protection. So step two with the FTZ is applying to CBP to activate and be able to use the FTZ. And all FTZ activity then remains under US uh, CBP supervision. So anything that goes into an FTZ is done with the, you know, through CBP procedures. Anything that goes out of an FTZ is through CBP procedures. And I'm um, sure the good folks here in the center of the room can tell you more about those details. But, uh, but FTZs are also open to um, spot checks. Um, you know, it's something to be aware of, again, if you're considering the program, that, um, that the facility remains under a customs bond. And so you are, you know, the, the, the way you track inventory, what you bring in, where everything is, how you're accounting for it, is very important in the FTZ environment. So the way the FTZ program is structured, and again, this goes back to 1934 when Congress set up the program. They created the FTZ board, and the board, I'm actually on the board staff. The FTZ board itself is the Department of Commerce and the Department of Treasury. Uh, I'm with the staff of the board, we're located in Commerce. But the way it works after that is the board designates public or public type organizations to act as something we call FTZ grantees. And the grantee is the local organization that manages the zone. And all authority from the FTZ board goes through the grantee. In this area, it's the city of San Jose. So Joe is your, your face for the, for the FTZ grantee here in San Jose, in the San Jose area, I should say. <laughs> um, but uh, the, the grantee is then responsible, actually, for acting as a public utility and providing zone services on a uniform basis to companies in a region. Um, so that the grantee is also the one that markets the zone. The grantee, of course, is not the one handling merchandise uh, or you know, concerned about that type of thing. The grantee is the one that makes sure that companies can access the program in their area. In order to use an FTZ, you as a company will need to work with your local grantee 
either the city of San Jose here in this area, or you know, most actually custom sports of entries, there is a grantee and an FTZ established. So if you're in a different area, there's probably already a grantee there that you can work with. You might be able to work with one even a little bit further if there's not. But in most parts of the country now, there is a grantee established, a zone you can use, and you would need to work with and through that grantee to get access to the FTZ program. What can you do in a zone? The FTZ Act itself has a whole list of the specific activities you can do. The important things, warehousing, distribution, of course, that type of activity, manufacturing, production, you'll hear us call it. Um, what you can't do is the important thing, no retail trade. So these are not duty-free shops. Um, you also can't live in an FTZ, <laughs> if you would want to. Um, s but uh, basically anything else in the course of normal business activity can be done in an FTZ. Uh, if you're doing anything that falls under our definition of production, which is essentially does it change the HDS classification at the six-digit level, then you need specific authority from the FTZ board. Uh, if you're not doing that, if you're simply, say, uh, warehousing, you're running a distribution facility, you need designation of your site from the FTZ board, and you can then apply to CBP to activate. But if you're doing any production activity, and again, for our purposes, that's anything that changes the classification at the six-digit level, then you need specific authority from the FTZ board. And we'll talk about how to get that. If you've heard about the program in the past and lengthy application processes, book length, <laughs> year-long process, the good news is it's nothing like that anymore. But first of all, why would you want to do this to begin with? What are the benefits? So we, we talked really at the high level. FTZs are places where you can defer U.S. Customs Entry. What does that mean for you as a company? It means if you're operating a distribution facility, you bring merchandise into your FTZ, and again, when you bring it into your FTZ, you've not filed a, a Customs Entry. You have not paid duty. Do you're doing something called an admission. It's coming into the U.S., but you're not filing an entry. You can store it in your FTZ, and you don't file the entry and pay the duties until it leaves your FTZ for the U.S. market. So especially if you have high values, um, and right now it's not uncommon to have high um, duty rates on some components, you can defer the payment of those duties until you file that entry, it leaves your FTZ for the U.S. market. If you re-export the merchandise, you've never filed an entry. So you never pay the duty. And of course, if you're operating a distribution facility, I'm just using that as an example right now, um, say you have customers in Canada, other places, this can be your distribution facility for the North American market. Bring merchandise here, defer the duty on what you're ultimately bringing into the US market, and uh, you never file an entry or pay duty on shipments elsewhere. So that could, especially now with uh, components having some higher duty rates, that uh, could be a real benefit for some companies. Traditionally, the biggest benefit for companies has been what we refer to as the inverted tariff. Now, if any of you have actually seen a printed copy of the, the HDS, the Harmonized Tariff Schedule, the document that sets the duty rates for anything that comes into the country, if you print it out, it's probably about this thick. It was a few years ago, I, the last time I saw a printed copy, and it was three volumes about this big each. I don't know what it would be right now, but it's a, it's a long document. There's a lot in there. And it's not uncommon for there to be situations, unintentionally, of course, where there's a higher duty rate on a component that you need in your manufacturing operations compared to, the, to what you're producing, your finished products. And if that's the case for you as a company, what you can do, and again, this, this does require approval from the FTZ board, but what you can do is bring in those components into your facility, combine them with domestic merchandise, and when you ship them to the US market, when you file that entry, you can pay duty on the value of those foreign components at the lower finished product duty rate. So it's a, it's a bit of a complex situation. But, um, but if you can imagine, say you're, you're making cars have a 2.5% duty rate. Does that apply to electric vehicles also? It does, OK. <laughs> so you, your cars have a 2.5% duty rate. Um, I know that is the case. I'm going to make something up now. But say you're. Um, 
I know this is not going to be true now. I'm, I'm, we're going to say radios because it's easy to imagine. But say you're bringing in radios that have a 5% duty rate. Um, you bring it into the FTZ. You manufacture it into your car. When it leaves the FTZ for the US market, you can pay the 2.5% duty rate on the value of those radios because it's been manufactured into a car. So you can see right there, again, depending on your industry, depending on what components you're using, there could be real savings. And the, the reality behind this is most companies that are importing components, they're importing some components, they're, produ they're using others that are sourced domestically. We live in a global economy. And, you know, there is a lot of sourcing that does occur from abroad, and it's very difficult for a country to, or excuse me, a company to source everything domestically. We recognize that. The point is we would rather have you conduct that activity here than, say, go to another country, make your finished car, and pay 2.5% on the whole thing. We want you to do it here. Employ US workers, US value added. Do the activity here so we can give you the same customs tariff situation as if you were conducting it abroad, but you're employing US workers. So for most companies, if you're manufacturing, this is where the big savings are. But again, it does vary by company. So you, you will need to take a look at the specific things that you're bringing in and, and the duty rates on those and the duty rates on what you're producing. Now, very importantly, what I want to point out here before, once again, anyone gets too excited, um, the little asterisk we should put at the end of this, that this really applies to those unintentional duty situations. So in that long and complicated HTS schedule, where those situations just happen to arise, that there is a higher duty rate on your finish or on your component compared to your finished product. Where this cannot be used is where there are intentional duties placed on things. Um, the obvious examples there, of course, are anti-dumping, countervailing duties, Section 201, Section 301, uh, 232, excuse me, also, um, the big ones. <laughs> Those actually, anything subject to any of those measures has to be placed in a special status when it goes into the FTZ. And that status locks in its identity. So even if those items are manufactured into something that is not subject to those duties, you still have to pay those duties when they leave the zone for the US market. Now, that's again for the US market. If you're exporting those, then once again, you would never have filed an entry so if you are subject to any of those types of special duties and you have any exports, the FTZ could still be an option. And actually, we've heard from companies recently that um, have started using the program simply to defer those duties because they can be quite high. But, but the FTZ cannot be a loophole around them. So we're here to help US manufacturers, but we can't be a, a loophole around very intentional government policy either. All right, a few other things to mention. So there are logistical benefits uh, that, that companies can achieve through the FTZ as well. In addition to you know, what we've heard from some companies is that their insurance costs might actually decrease because they've gone through these, the, you know, the activation process, they've really, their processes are secure, their inventory is very controlled. So, uh, but beyond that, um, there are actually some, some other procedures that you may qualify for, um, such as direct delivery, which could with CBP again, and they can actually answer more detailed questions about these than I can. But uh, basically, your product may be able to move more smoothly and quickly to your facility from the port. And you may also qualify for something called weekly entry, uh, which means that instead of filing one entry every time something leaves your FTZ, and of course, paying the associated merchandise processing fees and any broker fees, um, you can set up a process with CBPs so that you only file one entry per week. So one merchandise processing fee, one broker fee uh, for the week. So for some companies, again, if, they, if you meet the criteria and it's approved by CBP, there, there can be some significant savings there as well. Luckily, the last bullet here does not apply to California. <laughs> so there are a few states left that have um, an inventory tax and merchandise in an FTZ is impacted by the inventory tax. And it's actually much simpler for you to access the program uh, without that, because there are, there are some specific things that have to occur to make sure that, say, local school districts 
are not then negatively impacted by the FTZ. So the, the happy news we can share for you here is you don't really have to worry about that last bullet here, here in California. And it says it's a benefit, but it actually does make it a little bit more difficult to access the program. Another important thing, and this I think is a little bit of a lesser known benefit to the program, we call it the production equipment benefit. So if you have an FTZ and you're set up for manufacturing, you have what we call production authority from the FTZ board, or you're in the process of applying for it, and you're constructing a plant or you're expanding a plant, you don't need any separate approval. You can bring in any imported production equipment to the FTZ and FTZ status, um, assemble it, test it. You don't have to file an entry and pay duty on that production equipment until it's ready to go into use. So again, if you have a large plant with a lot of equipment that say you can only buy from overseas, uh, this can help you to defer the duty on that equipment or possibly even reduce it. Again, because of that inverted tariff we we're talking about, there might be a lower duty rate on that equipment than as assembled than, uh, than in, in the pieces that it was brought in. So if you're, again, this doesn't apply just to new plants, but if you have an existing plant and you're expanding it, um, you know, this could be either way. But it, obviously, if it's new construction, a new plant, you know, this could be a real benefit. We've already touched on this, but why does the program exist generally? Um, the idea, of course, we said was to encourage activity and employment here in the U.S., uh, facilitate international commerce, I think it is also stated in the FTZ Act. Keep things moving. Help encourage and attract activity here. Uh, that really that we're open for business and business can operate smoothly here. So come conduct your activity here in the U.S. instead of doing it abroad. I'm really, that's what it comes down to. I talked a little bit about the structure. And I, I don't want to steal Joe's thunder later. He said he was going to talk about his role as grantee also. But I'll just give you a quick background, because it is a little bit hard to visualize. And it, it sounds very bureaucratic. We've got this board, and then we've got customs, and we have all these organizations involved. But this is just a quick summary of how it's structured. So the FTZ board, and again, that's uh, Secretary of Commerce and the Secretary of Treasury, is at the top there. So I'm, my office would be a little box off of that, you know, where there's staff. Um, but the, the FTZ board grants the authority to, to organizations, that's why we call them the grantees, in this case the city of San Jose. And the city of San Jose manages the zone locally and provides access to companies in that region. So the grantee is next below the FTZ board. The operator is the company that's holding the bond with CBP. So an operator may be processing its own merchandise which key, well, we'll get to that on the next slide. But basically, the operator is the one that's responsible to CBP. They've gone through the activation process, they're holding the bond, and they're doing that under the authority of the grantee. So to be an FTZ operator, you'll actually enter into, into an agreement with the grantee um, to, to essentially use their authority. At the very bottom here, what we have, we call the user. So the user is essentially the one that's benefiting from the FTZ, probably the owner of the merchandise. Um, the user could be the operator. So you could be an operator processing your own merchandise, in which case, you know, you'd be that one over on the far right-hand side, whichever screen we're looking at, um, the operator user. You're processing your own merchandise. You have the bond with CBP. But you could also be acting as operator, say, a logistics company, and have multiple users. Again, that's perfectly fine. Um, it's actually not uncommon. And in that case, it'd be this box over here on the left-hand side where you have multiple users underneath the operator. So there can be different ways of structuring the FTZ. Um, even in one zone, there can be different setups for different companies. You might hear some of these words getting tossed around, though, so I wanted to make sure you knew what they were. So the process has changed pretty dramatically in the past about 10 years in terms of accessing the program. When I started out in this office, it was not uncommon. A company wanted to use the zone. They come in with what we call a subzone application to have their facility designated. It's about this thick. And they'd submit it to us, and we'd say, great, we'll get back to you in about a year. 
it didn't work very well. <laughs> And it was actually, we, we didn't do many of these types of events because, well, you can imagine what the response would have been. <laughs> um, it, it, very simply, it just did not work. And, and there were different ways we tried to get around and tried to do things on a quicker basis. And quite frankly, it was a mess. Um, we needed to make changes, and we did. About 10 years ago, uh, we came up with something we called the Alternative Site Framework. And of course, the only reason it has that name is there's the way things had always been done. So we call that the traditional site framework. And we gave grantees this option of using this new format, this new structure really for their zones. What it means essentially is that the grantee has done a lot of the work up front. So what used to take all those steps we would have to take, because the FTZ Act tells us we have to take them, the grantee has done it up front. And that means that when a company wants to use the FTZ program, the grantee's done all the work. There's very little left that needs to be done. We can designate a, a site or a subzone, essentially the same terminology, designate something for your company when and where you need it in a very quick and simple process. Um, again, for really reasons of evolution and how things have developed throughout the program, you'll see the phrase usage-driven site and subzone kind of used interchangeably. Again, unfortunately, we have two terms from them, how things have evolved. If we were designing the program from new, we would only have one term. But if you're a company that wants to use the FTZ program, you would either have a usage-driven site or a subzone designated for you. The process is the same. What you can do in it is the same. Uh, there's really no substantive difference. It's just the way things have evolved. You can call it whatever you want. And anywhere within the area that the grantee has designated, the FTZ board has approved as what we call a service area for that zone, you can get your site designation from the FTZ board within 30 days. And I can say this on behalf of my colleague Chris Kemp that would handle your application. Um, we ha both have a similar policy. If it's on our desk, it's complete, it's not going to take you 30 days to get a decision. I, you know, He's out of town right now, so if you submit it, well, he's, he's back in the office in a, about a week and a half, I think. Um, so you might have to wait a week and a half. But uh, we both have a, a pretty strict clean desk, clean desk policy. So if it comes in, we're going to get it back out to you as soon as possible. It says 30 days, it's probably not even going to take 30 days. So it, it's a very simple, I think we have a slide, whoops, okay, we'll go back to that. But this shows you really what we're asking for. What's your company name? What's the address? The acreage? Do you have the right to use the site? We need a map. Um, you will need to talk to US Customs and Border Protection because we need to know that they will be able to oversee the site. And that's it. Send that in to us and we will get it right back out to you with your site or your subzone designation. And it's really that simple. If I bring back up to that slide I skipped, and again, I won't hover on this too long because I, I think uh, Joe is going to cover something similar, but uh, you might not be able to read most of it. But at the, the top of the screen, it's the service area for uh, the San Jose zone. So anywhere within that area, you can use this quick and simple process have it designated. If you're not within that, don't worry. We'll talk about that in a minute. The rest of that, that what you see up here, is what appears on our page, our, our website, uh, that provides information about each zone. So um, Joe's contact information is up there. But just to give you a summary, you know this, this information is up there on our website for all zones. So if you have facilities located elsewhere, this information is available. Uh, the same information is available in those zones as well. Now, you were looking at that list and saying, gosh, it sounds great, but I'm just outside that area that's, that's called the service area. What do I do? First of all, don't panic. Um, it's not quite as simple, it's not quite as short, but we've still drastically shortened the process even without being in this ASF service area uh, to bring designation to to a company. So if you're outside the ASF service area, we have to do, it has to be called a subzone, and it's either a three or five month process. Otherwise, the information we ask for is the same 
except that we also need the legal authority um, for the zone to submit the application. So that's, that's one of the things that's already been done, that the grantee's already done for their service area. So if it's a subzone outside the service area, it's one of the things we need to cover. Unfortunately, the way our regs are structured, there's also a fee for those types of applications, uh, and there's not a fee under the service area, but there is if it's not under the service area. Those are really the only differences. Um, otherwise, it's just a few months longer. We will have to open a public comment period for these types of applications. We usually don't get comments on this type of thing, but, but it is a step that we will have to go through. So we have the site designated or the subzone designated, but you're also going to be manufacturing. What do you do then? So it is a separate request, but you don't need to wait. So you could actually start your request for production authority, we call it, from the FTZ board. You can start that at any time. You don't have to have your subzone designated yet. You can start this request whenever you're ready. Um, the request to, for production authority is a 120-day process with the FTZ board. So again, production in the FTZ world, what you need authority for is anything that changes the HTS classification at the six-digit level. That, of course, was going to include any traditional manufacturing, but what it also includes is things you would not think of initially. So you're, say, a distribution facility, and you have some clients that uh, have asked you to do a little bit of a different activity in your warehouse for them this year. They're bringing in bottles of liquor and some glassware, and they say, hey, can you just uh, bring these into your FTZ, put them in a box together, so I'm ready for the holiday season. I can get them out to the stores. Sounds simple. It's going to employ at least a few people. Sounds good. That is actually production activity in the FTZ world because you're bringing in the liquor bottles and you're bringing in, you're importing, in this example, you're importing the liquor bottles and you're importing uh, the glassware and putting them together in a box. And when they leave the zone, they're going to be classified as the liquor. So you could actually be reducing the duty on that glassware. So it's not, people think of production activity that's you know a big factory. It's not necessarily. If you're reducing the duty rate, you're changing the HTS classification on those items, then it's something that you do need production authority from the FTZ board. So just be aware, it's not, uh, you know, there could be situations that you wouldn't initially think of where you do need authority from the FTZ board. If you do, it's okay. It's, again, it's not a really lengthy process. It's 120 days from the time you submit the application to us until the time a decision is made. And there's not much to this request either. So, you know, the steps we have to take into account. We will open up a public comment period, and we will uh, just discuss briefly with um, industry specialists within commerce. But that's it. And the, the information that you have to submit to us, it's really, again, your company, where are you located? And then we'll ask for a list of your finished products. So that's what leaves your zone and your imported components, what goes into your zone. And that's all we're asking for. We'll go through these steps, and if we don't see any issues, then we'll say go ahead and do it at day 120. Now, if we do see issues, okay, so that's that 120-day process. Um, if we do see issues, then we might have to bump it to a longer process, but in the history, so these regs have been in place since 2012, I think we've had 300 some requests for production activity and about 10 that we've said we need to review this through the more detailed process. And it's, it's usually pretty predictable industries. Um, manufacturing textiles has always been very controversial in FTZ uh, environments. So I mean, for the most part, companies get the authorization within 120 days. And if you give us a list of say 20 components that you're importing, and we're, we have concerns about one of them. We're not going to say no to the whole thing. We can say, yes, go ahead and do it. But for this one, you have to put it in a special status. So you can't reduce the duty on that item. 
Uh, so, you know, don't be afraid even that the whole thing's going to get denied. You know, if, if there is that concern about one little product, we can, we can just authorize everything else. So the, the timeline overall is, is pretty simple. And again, these processes do not have to run back to back. They can run at the same time. You can get your production notification in before your subzone application. You can have them running at the same time. You can do the subzone first and then your production. So it is two processes, but they're both pretty simple. And you know, you can start either one of them whenever you're ready. So you're with your within the service area, 30 days to get your subzone say designated, and 120 days for your production notification. The reality is most companies can't be activated with CVP in that time frame anyway, <laughs> that it's going to take longer for you to, to get all the, the requirements that CVP has. So while your applications are being processed by the FTZ board, you can also be discussing the activation with CVP, getting ready so that when you have the authorization, you're you know, as ready to go as possible and can get up and running as soon as possible. So you're designated, you have all your approvals in place, CVP has approved your activation. Oh, no, sorry, didn't look too carefully at the slide. So <laughs> you get your designations in place, then you apply to CVP uh, to actually activate. Um, I hinted at, at, that it was a more involved process with CVP, and again, they can answer details on that. But basically, it will involve uh, background investigations on key employees. CBP is going to take a look at the inventory control system that you're using, make sure that everything can be tracked from when the time it comes to the zone, through the zone, through any processes you're doing in the zone, until the time when it leaves the zone. Um, of course, they're also going to look at the security in place at your facility. And uh, you'll need to post a bond and have a written procedures manual. Hopefully there's no questions on that, otherwise I will defer them uh, to CBP. But otherwise, once you're, once you're approved, you're up and running, you're using the FTZ, um, there are a few things you will need to do. There's, and Joe mentioned there is an annual report to the FTZ board. Uh, we take all that information from you. You actually submit it to Joe. Joe will submit it to us. And we're required, again, this, this comes down to the law, we're required to submit a report to Congress. So um, it, it, we're required to do it, but I think it's actually very helpful. Um, you know, without that requirement, it be, could be difficult to get everyone to submit it in, but it's really useful to have information about what's happening in the program. Um, so the information you submit there is actually really, really important in terms of how the program is being used. And, uh, you know, helpful for you as a company also. You can take a look at the last year's report and see what types of companies are using it. Um, is this something that might benefit me if all my competitors are using it? You know, it's helpful in that sense as well. On an annual basis, you'll also have to do what's called a reconciliation of your inventory um, and uh, report the results of that to CBP. Um, but again, they can give more information on those details. So a little bit of background. There are, there are zones in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is part of the customs territory of the US. Um, more than 500 subzones, far more sites than that. Uh, we had yeah, 3,200 companies using the zone in our last report and about 450,000 employees. So there's a lot of companies in this country and a lot of employees. Th these are just the employees in the activated areas of the zone. So if you're designated but you're not using the zone, we're, we're not counting those employees. These are, these are the ones from the uh, again, the activated companies. This is the employees in that area. So the numbers are pretty big. Um, I, I should actually run the statistics, but I think that 670 billion in merchandise uh, handled through the zones. In terms of the foreign status merchandise coming into zones, I think it's about um, 10 to 12 percent of imports into the country are coming through FTZs. So the numbers are pretty big. And we had about 87 billion exported last year. These are just a few of the, the largest users in the program. Um, one of the changes we've seen as we've simplified the process to get sites designated and to get production authority in you know, quicker and simpler basis for companies, um, we've seen a lot of smaller companies enter the program that really could not in the past. So they're not necessarily going to be reflected in this list. Um, but we have seen a huge growth in the number of small, small companies. Um, throughout the country that are using the program. So again, if you don't see 
what appears to be your industry on this list, you know, don't worry, it doesn't mean that there's not a benefit there, or not savings there, or it's not something that you can do. But this is just as background. These are some of the, the biggest users of the program. I am not Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I did want to give you your, your regional contact. So my colleague Chris is the one that would be processing your request, you know, your, your site, your usage-driven um, request, and can really, he really knows the details of each zone in this region far better than I do. Um, but like I said, I'm not going to hang up on you <laughs> if you call. So, you know, contact anyone on our staff. We're, we're actually a staff of um, 10 people total. So, you know, we're a pretty tight-knit staff, and, you know, if you have questions about anything, you can contact any of us. I don't know how much time we have for questions, but happy to answer any questions. Question At the after. end. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. That is, was a great presentation. Uh, the word that I would use to describe the Foreign Trade Zones Board is responsive. Uh, Liz, Chris, uh, Andrew McGilvery, the Executive Secretary, and the entire staff are extremely responsive to the grantee, uh, and I know that our operators uh, would uh, share the same sentiment, that they're very responsive to any question or need that they have. Um, also, I would add that uh, a decade ago when the Foreign Trade Zones Board made changes to the program, uh, it made it much easier for companies to access the Foreign Trade Zone. Um, some of our operators applied under the old system, which um, their application was essentially a three-ring binder, and the application review uh, took anywhere from eight to 12 months. And as you heard from Liz, that has changed dramatically. And so now it's really a series of 10 questions, and it can be approved within 30 days. So um, the program has changed a great deal uh, through the leadership of the Foreign Trade Zones Board and uh, the uh, Foreign Trade Zones Board, uh, the Department of Commerce, and the Department of Treasury. So um, our next speaker is Joanne Valite, and Joanne is a valued partner of the City of San Jose. Uh, she is the director of the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, commercial office uh, that serves Silicon Valley. Uh, the office is located in downtown San Jose. Uh, Joanne joined the Department of Commerce in 2000. Uh, the U.S. Commercial Service is part of the Commerce International Trade Administration, uh, which includes a network of trade and policy professionals. Um, at U.S. embassies and consulates uh, in 70 countries abroad and 100 locations in the United States. Um, in addition to managing the San Jose office, which serves Silicon Valley, Joanne's portfolio includes aviation, defense, scientific instruments, financial services, uh, safety, and security. And uh, Joanne is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin and has studied at the Chinese University in Hong Kong and also at Nanjing University in China. So with that, Joanne Valit. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Joe. He, uh, the, the city of San Jose, um, as Liz, my colleague, had mentioned a moment ago, um, apart from you know being the grantee, um, part of uh, Joe's responsibility, of course, is raising awareness and marketing the program. And, and he just does such an incredible tireless um, job at, at raising awareness in the business community about something that I think probably a lot of companies really aren't aware of and may not know how to tap, um, hence you, know, you being here today. So thank you for making time, carving out the time from your schedules to come learn about this really important asset to our business community here in Silicon Valley. And kudos to Joe for all your work over the years. It's, it's always great to partner with you, Joe. Um, so I also um, am with U.S. Commercial, uh, with the International Trade Administration, part of the Department of Commerce, um, with my colleague Liz. Um, I work in the U.S. Commercial Service, which is the um, the federal government's lead export promotion function um, for uh, as for the government. We have um, offices across the United States, um, such as our office here in downtown San Jose. Um, we have other offices in the Bay Area as well. And as Joe mentioned, we have um, uh, com commercial specialists and commercial officers based at U.S. embassies and consulates around the world solely dedicated to supporting um, U.S. business interests um, in their local markets. So just a quick overview of some of the things that we do and where we sit. Um, 
th these are a few, there are a few different federal agencies that um, work to promote international trade in the United States. And I wanted to simply uh, put this up here to let you know that um, well, this is where we sit. And um, there are many resources out there available to you. Our office, our team here in San Jose would be happy to kind of go into greater detail, should you wish, um, about some of the other programs that are offered. But just know that there is uh, plenty of support out there to su support U.S. exports. As I mentioned, um, we have uh, personnel across the United States, such as here in our office uh, in San Jose, and on the ground overseas in roughly 150 international locations um, based at the U.S. embassies and consulates abroad. I'll go through a few of these boxes just to kind of give you a, a, a sort of a flavor of the types of things that we do with U.S. companies in terms of our, our casework um, in, in export promotion services. In addition to, I'll sp mostly spend some time talking about export promotion services, but we also are the lead federal agency to support foreign direct investment in the United States, um, as well as uh, market access and compliance issues, um, largely that are covered out of um, Liz's shop. I'll go over, I believe I put three here, three different um, services just to kind of give you an example of the types of things that we do with companies. This service, uh, the Gold Key Matching Services, is offered in all of our offices worldwide. Um, this is a service um, whereby a U.S. company, um, and we uh, largely, you know, Congress largely created us to support the small and mid-size business segment of the United States, which is the vast majority by far of, of the types of companies in the United States, but of course we work with companies of all sizes. Um, but the Gold Key Matching Services is for companies that are looking for a suitable, qualified, and screened business partner in a local market overseas. So for example, if you are um, a, a small company and you're looking at, for example, bidding on a government tender in, let's say, Brazil or Chile, um, and the government tender requires you to have a local presence or a local partner to work with, but you're a small company and you, you don't have the means or the uh, ability to necessarily do that qualification and due diligence from you know, your office here in Silicon Valley, you can um, avail yourself of the, of the Gold Key Matching Service, which would assist the U.S. Embassy actually sets up meetings to screen and qualify potential local business partners for you in that market. And that's something we offer worldwide. Another service, very a popular service of ours, is the International Company Profile, which we also refer to um, as our background check service. So this is a, this is a uh, background check that the U.S. Embassy um, will do uh, for a U.S. company. We'll do, we, we do this as for the U.S. company as our client um, on a foreign uh, business entity in the local market. So if you are looking at, for example, um, working with a local company in, say, Chile, um, and you would like the U.S. Embassy to uh, support you through um, your due diligence and a background check on that company, that's a service that the U.S. Embassy will provide. Single company promotion is um, a, a program whereby you're, you are the single company, and the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Commercial Service are promoting you. Um, the way this works is we would work, you know, we, we would sit down with you, discuss the type of program that you're looking at um, uh, conducting in, say, France. Uh, the, lots of companies use this for things like press events, ribbon cuttings, training, um, uh, receptions, cocktail receptions, dinners, and that sort of thing. The idea is that the embassy would assist you, would work directly with your company to develop um, a list of, of uh, attendees for an event that you would like to see in, in the room with you, and then you use that event to raise awareness of, of obviously, of your product or your service. This is oftentimes um, a service that's followed up after a company has done a program such as a gold key, for example, uh, because it makes a lot of sense to do a promotional event in, say, France in this case, when you have your local business partner there at your side um, so when you leave the program and head home, your local business partner is right there to continue on the business development for you in the local region. Another really important um, way we support U.S. companies internationally is through our uh, official U.S. government advocacy. 
Um, this is where the Commerce Department um, through um, the Secretary works directly with state to provide official U.S. government advocacy for U.S. companies. So the way this would look would be, for example, if a foreign government is doing an RFP for a public tender, let's say they're developing a port project and you're going in as a prime contractor or you're going in as a sub to another prime, the other prime doesn't even necessarily have to be a U.S. firm. But so long as there is sufficient U.S. content, you're able to demonstrate that there is a um, uh, U.S. employment that's impacted, positively impacted, um, and you're, you know, the U.S. economy is deriving significant benefit from the project should you win it. Uh, you can apply for advocacy. Um, there, there is no cost to you to do that. Uh, the Advocacy Center is based, um, again, within the Department of Commerce in Washington, D.C., and we process um, advocacy requests all the time for U.S. companies that are uh, bidding on overseas project. This is uh, typically um, on a pu public tender basis. These are just a few links, and we'll um, pass. Uh, we'll uh, have this presentation available after the program too. So these are just a few helpful links um, for you to uh, to cruise around um, <laughs> and avail yourselves of after the program. Um, we, I wanted to, uh, in closing, uh, offer up a short uh, four-minute video of a company in Sunnyvale. Um, we have, uh, over the past about three or four years, made, um, we've, we've started do doing these client testimonials through video um, of many of our clients in a variety of different industries. All the videos are um, available on trade.gov forward slash success so you can see brewers, you can see uh, pipeline manufacturers, you can see ICT companies, services. Uh, we have a variety of different industries that sort of share their story in terms of um, how we've worked with them to support their global sales. And this one is for Liquid Robotics. We just posted it yesterday, so we're very excited about that. And um, they're here in Sunnyvale. I think you'll enjoy it. why it's not displaying. <laughs> okay, well, if we can get that in a, in a minute, I can show that to you. Um, the The last slide I was going to put up, and if we can get the video going in a minute, it's, it's pretty cool, so I think you'll like it. Um, and it's always much more fun to hear from our clients. Um, they, I wanted to mention as well that uh, we have a couple opportunities coming up this week. Um, this afternoon, uh, we will be here, Liz and I, Joe, um, and Shannon Frazier, Cindy Ma, and Chris Dom of our office are going to be available till 4.30 today in this room. Um, if you'd like to sign up for uh, appointments to visit with us, um, that uh, sign-up list is going to be in the back by our banner. And um, we also, on Friday of this week, have two uh, of our commercial specialists here visiting. They're actually at the RSA conference in San Francisco this week. Um, but they'll be in our office on Friday. One of our colleagues from uh, the U.S. Embassy in Singapore um, will be here, and the, uh, the other colleague is from the U.S. Commercial Service Office in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Um, and we have, they cover a variety of different industries, primarily in the IT ICT sector, but our colleague from Vietnam also covers the life sciences. So we are um, hosting appointments in our office, 30-minute appointments. Um, with the companies, or with the uh, with our colleagues, and those are also available to you. Um, you can simply sign up with Shannon in the back, um, with the orange jacket, and um, we do have a few appointments still available. And feel free to do that after the program. Thank you, Joe.
Thank you very much, Joanne. Um, my presentation is going to be relatively brief because what follows uh, my presentation is, I think, one of the more valuable aspects of the program, and that's uh, the panel discussion of, of uh, two of our operators, um, and I think you will find that most uh, helpful. So as, as you know, the City of San Jose is the grantee of Foreign Trade Zone 18. Uh, the City of San Jose um, received Foreign Trade Zone authority in 1974. So our Foreign Trade Zone in San Jose was one of the early Foreign Trade Zones in the US. Uh, we're Foreign Trade Zone number 18. And in 2012, we went through the process to redesignate our foreign trade zone as an alternative site framework. And as you heard, that allows companies to apply for foreign trade zone authority through a much more expedited process and a simplified process. And so that has been um, extremely valuable to uh, the companies and to the region. Um, as you heard, the, the service area of Foreign Trade Zone 18 includes San Jose, and so we went through the process and we designated the city of San Jose as our service area. And then the following year, we revised our application and we included all of Santa Clara County. So all of the cities and towns in Santa Clara County are part of the service area of Foreign Trade Zone 18. And then we also included uh, Scotts Valley and Santa Cruz and in Alameda County, Fremont, Hayward, Newark, and Union City. Now, as part of the application process, we were required to have one contiguous area. And there are foreign trade zone grantees served by the Port of San Francisco and also by the City of Oakland. And so that was part of the reason that we designated these areas as part of our foreign trade zone. Um, uh, when we went through the process, we had foreign trade zones uh, already established in Fremont and Southern Alameda County, and so we included um, that in our new service area as well. Um, the city is able to submit applications to the board for companies outside of the service area, but as you heard from Liz, the process is a little bit different and uh, usually does require um, a federal register notice and a public comment period, and that can make the process a bit longer. Um, in San Jose, um, the current uh, operators are uh, Space Systems Loral, and Virginia Lloyd is here today from Space Systems Loral. Uh, LAM Research, uh, they um, are a manufacturing company. Uh, their lead, Malcolm Appelby, was planning to be here, but uh, he had an, uh, uh, a management meeting that he was required to attend, so he unfortunately is not here today. Uh, Tesla is uh, part of our foreign trade zone. Um, and then RK Logistics Group, and you'll hear from RK. Uh, Bloom Energy, uh, Bloom Energy is our newest foreign trade zone operator. Uh, they received approval from the Foreign Trade Zones Board back in September. And um, also San Jose Distribution Services, they've been part of our foreign trade zone since 1982. So they were one of the pioneers in the program. Uh, their site in San Jose is currently not activated, uh, but it would be a very easy process to reactivate. And I'm very pleased that Tom Guerrera and Mike Minardi from uh, San Jose Distribution is here, and also uh, Darren from uh, Bloom Energy and, and several of her colleagues are here as well. We uh, particularly welcome them, and uh, the city, of course, works very closely with um, each of our operators. So um, I think uh, Liz touched on part of the responsibility of the grantee. Um, as she mentioned, when a company is seeking foreign trade zone authority, it's actually the grantee that is the applicant rather than the, the company that will be operating the zone. So the role of the grantee is to submit application to the foreign trade zones board uh, for new projects and any changes to the foreign trade zone. Um, I should point out that when a company is operating a foreign trade zone, they're able to operate within the scope of authority, which has been granted by the foreign trade zones board. And that includes what the company has requested in their application and what the board has granted. If a company's business model changes and they want to do something that is not in the scope of authority, uh, they are required to work through the grantee to seek that authority and submit a new application. Um, also, the, the grantee submits uh, concurrence letters to US Customs and Border Protection to activate or deactivate um, the zone. One of the great benefits of the foreign trade zone is really flexibility. It allows a company to uh, 
to really change their footprint. Uh, it certainly required that, uh, you know, what has been approved in the application is what you're working within, but a company can activate or deactivate space based on what their needs might be. Um, also, uh, the, the grantee across the country, not only the city of San Jose, but all grantees interact extensively with the Foreign Trade Zones Board and also U.S. Customs and Border Protection. And I would add that Customs has been extremely helpful in our region in meeting with companies that have expressed interest in the Foreign Trade Zone program, talking about the activation process, talking about um, um, the requirements that um, to make sure that um, the facility that is designated as a foreign trade is safe and secure. Uh, as you heard from Liz, uh, Customs and Border Protection um, reviews applications and provide the con provides the concurrence. And without having the meeting and, and the interaction with the company, Customs and Border Protection is really not in a position to provide the concurrence. So having a relationship with Customs and Border Protection is very important early in the process. As you heard from Liz, um, each grantee is required to operate the zone as a public utility and provide uniform treatment. So a grantee is required to provide the same level of service and uh, as you heard, uh, an agreement is required between the grantee and the operator. There cannot be significant changes from one agreement to another agreement. They need to be uniform. Um, and as you heard, the, it's the, the grantee that has the responsibility to oversee the foreign trade zone within their area. Uh, so we meet with companies, we meet with others to talk about the foreign trade zone, educate uh, uh, b the business community, be it community about the advantages of the foreign trade zone program. And as you heard, we also submit the annual report to Congress, which is critically important because this program was created um, by the U.S. Congress back in 1934. Uh, they have a very strong interest in this program, and many members of Congress um, are very active supporters of the FTZ program. Um, the city of San Jose, as the grantee, does have a few fees. Uh, the fees are established by the city council. Um, the fees can vary from grantee across the country. Um, they are required to be posted on the Foreign Trade Zones Board website. So in San Jose, our uh, fees are an application fee of $525, uh, an annual fee of $300, which is, I think, far less than most grantees. And then we have a one-time fee of $2,775 to establish the agreement, uh, and that involves usually work our city attorney's office working with the attorney's office of, of the company that's uh, seeking a foreign trade zone. So um, uh, those are the fees, um, and um, uh, that's my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions a bit later, but now is actually my favorite part of the program, and that's uh, the session with our operators. So at this point, I'd like to invite uh, Anthony and Shannon from Tesla to come up and also Rock and uh, Rich from the RK Logistics Group. Okay, so um, first I'd like to provide brief introductions of our, our panel members. Um, Rock Magnum has been with RK since uh, 2015, and he is the Chief Operating Officer and President. Uh, he has 35 years of experience in, in warehousing and logistics, uh, specializing in operations. And the RK uh, Logistics Company is based in Fremont. Uh, Rich Rainier is the Program Manager at RK Logistics Group. Uh, he's been um, involved with them since 2012. He's joined RK in 2012, and he started working on the Foreign Trade Zone project back in 2014. Uh, their Foreign Trade Zone was activated in 2015, and uh, they are a very active zone as part of Foreign Trade Zone number 18. Uh, Anthony uh, Vu is a uh, uh, FTZ administrator for uh, Tesla in Fremont. And uh, his colleague, Shannon Castriotis, is also uh, a foreign trade zone administrator at 
at Tesla. She joined the company uh, five years ago. She has 10 years of experience in distribution and manufacturing. Uh, she's a licensed custom broker. And she's been, both she and Anthony have been very involved in a number of the uh, Tesla FTZ projects um, in recent years. And I can attest, as the board can as well, that it's very active with uh, modifications, new applications, um, alterations. And in addition to that, she's currently involved in implementing uh, Tesla's new foreign trade zone site in Sparks, Nevada. So. Um, Thank you very much for taking time from your very busy schedule to uh, join us today and sharing your expertise and knowledge uh, about the Foreign Trade Zone program to the, with the business community. Um, I, I have uh, a few questions. Um, and for this session, we, we definitely do want to open the floor up for questions and discussion. But at first, I would like to ask uh, uh, maybe if you could provide a brief overview of your company and how long you've been involved with the Foreign Trade Zone program. President of the Arcade Group. Um, we're a family-owned business here in, in uh, the East Bay of California. We're located in Fremont. We've been around since 1983. Uh, for the last two years, we've been part of the fastest 50 growing, uh, fastest 50 uh, growing privately held companies in the Silicon Valley, as recognized by the Silicon Valley Business Journal. So that's been uh, good. A lot of our growth has come from operating um, foreign trade zones. Um, so we talked about a lot of the grantees, um, excuse me, the operators that Joe's mentioned. So we do work with Tesla. We do work with LAM Research. We're going to be doing work with Bloom uh, Energy on their FTZ. We, know, we also operate our own FTZ uh, under Arcade Logistics Group. So um, we've known these companies since basically we got into the FTZ business, and it's been a great growth opportunity for us. So I work for Tesla. Um, we work. Thanks. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> We're for Tesla. Um, we were founded in 2003, and I like to always share our mission statement. So the mission statement was to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable transport. And that has been kind of the founding philosophy of the company. And you see it kind of if you follow our timeline of our progression as a company. Uh, we started out with uh, a proof of concept car called the Roadster. Uh, nobody really thought electric cars would, uh, <laughs> would be a cool car to drive and people would want it. And so uh, when we made the roaster, it kind of checked everybody's box. Like, yeah, you know, electric car can be fun to have. Um, and then, uh, you know, kind of our business model of Tesla was always to build a really, really cool, expensive car um, to show it can be done and then move it down to a lesser expensive car, which would be our Model S and X, um, to make it a little bit more affordable for people to buy and show that we could do mass production. And we're now finally hitting our uh, stage of where we're mass producing an affordable car, and that's our Model 3. Um, and we're, um, we're hopefully reaching, reaching that goal <laughs> of getting it. Um, and then so I, I mentioned the mission statement to begin with uh, was sustainable transport. Uh, probably like in 2015, 16, we changed our, we tweaked, I should say more, of our mission statement to go to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. And so as Tesla kind of has evolved over the years, uh, we've taken a more holistic uh, approach of our products of um, being more energy conscious. And that would be our power wall, our power packs. Um, it's more of an integrative, vertical integration. You buy our car, uh, you are running on electricity. You can buy our station or storage where you can store energy. And then you can buy our tile roofs um, where you collect the energy. And so you could be 100% off the grid um, and really promote sustainable energy. So that was just kind of a uh, little background of Tesla. And I recall, Shannon, um, meeting with your company early on during the Roadster era, yeah. before uh, Tesla had purchased uh, what had been the NUMI facility in Fremont. So your company was thinking about the FTZ at the very beginning. Yes, in the early days, um, the factory was predominantly shut down. We took it over, um, and one of the the things that Tesla did being so new and, and really cash conscious was to look at the factory, an old shuttered down <laughs> auto um, manufacturing um, facility. And we did, we looked at everything we could reuse, we put in a line, everything we couldn't, we scrapped, and the rest we got rid of. And we were only using about a third of the factory um, in the beginning days to conserve um, you know, energy and space. We just weren't that big. And over the years, we've just expanded till we're kind of busting out the seams right now. <laughs> So thank you. Um, what are the key benefits that your company derives from operating as a foreign trade zone? 
Let me kind of explain what, what we do as a, um, we're a general purpose FTZ. So we, we hold the FTZ uh, authority from, from the city of San Jose, but we're open to the public. So all these steps you saw behind here as an individual company, we've already done. So to work within our zone, all you have to do is bring your product into our zone and then Rich manages it uh, on your behalf. Um, now, if you're going to manufacture in the zone, again, Rich works with the, uh, your company and the foreign trade zone to get that manufacturing process approved, but you don't actually hold yourself a, a, a separate subzone authority. You work with that within our zone. So if you're a distribution company, if you're a manufacturing company, if you are a company, as Liz described, that's doing kidding, uh, changing the harmonized code, we can do that for you within the, our foreign trade zone. So you don't have, to have your own authority. Uh, but again, all the steps that Liz described about getting uh, permission to do that manufacturing process, you can do with, uh, you have to get that approved separately. Uh, but again, Rich manages that for us and makes sure that all takes place. Um, and again, we operate foreign trade zones um, for LAM, for Tesla, and soon to be uh, for Bloom Energy as well. Um, for our purposes, we're doing warehousing work for them, but uh, and they have manufacturing FTZs throughout the Bay Area that we support, and that's kind of how we work. So again, allows us to grow our business, allows us to uh, get um, entry into to major manufacturers in the, in the Bay Area. Um, and again, for a small family-owned company, it's been a great growth um, model for us. Uh, yeah, so for Tesla, um, I, I would say I'll list the three main benefits that um, Tesla gains from operating through the foreign trade zone. Um, the number one saving for us is the invertive tariff. Um, benefit. Um, Liz mentioned a lot of our um, components that come into the zone have a higher duty rate and so uh, we'll emit them into the zone and it will um, leave the zone at a 2.5 percent duty rate. Um, Tesla is also um, pretty much a 50-50 net exporter and so um, it's a great cash savings never to have to pay duty up front and then go through a different program like duty drawback to recover um, the components that went into a finished vehicle that was ultimately exported abroad. And um, the, the last one, um, I would say just in, in recent months and something that Tesla's really interested in getting into more is, is the idea of the deferred duty, uh, mainly with the Section 301 and the 232. Uh, they're high duty rates. And like I said, we are 50-50 um, net exporter. And if we can bring in a component at a very high duty rate, uh, we don't have to pay that duty rate until we admit the car into North America and ultimately sell it to the customer. So it's a cash flow savings um, that's definitely becoming higher up on our our total pool of benefits. Thank you. What are, or are there challenges uh, that you face as an operator? Uh, key issues that you face? Um, well, sure, there are some challenges with it. Um, I think the biggest part working as a uh, general purpose um, uh, operator is making sure we can marry our customers' needs with the requirements that uh, have to be fulfilled from a FTB, FTZ standpoint. And so it's it's not a quick turn operation. I mean, the processes are quick, but um, making sure we've got your processes defined sufficiently to get FTZ board approval to do that manufacturing work does take some time and does take some precision. And Rich can also talk some of the challenges of, of expanding and contracting an FTZ as well. Yeah, so I'm, I'm more the day-to-day -day guy. I'm more in the weeds, and I've been through uh, a number of activations and deactivations, so I'm, I'm f familiar with those processes, and those are actually fairly straightforward now uh, once you've done them a few times. Um, for me, the challenges are always about uh, security, compliance, and making sure that we have a, a culture uh, throughout the employees that recognize the importance of uh, having accurate inventory or knowing the certain procedures and steps you need to go through to maintain a zone. And just one more thing from a benefit standpoint that, that maybe you don't, you don't see on the surface. Um, there's a much more compliance level within an FTZ than, than you can see within a general warehouse. Um, if you go to our Fremont facility, you walk through multiple FTZs, each one secured within itself as, as a separate FTZ. Uh, that's done by Custom and Border Protection. Uh, but also, our employees are held to a different, a higher standard, if you will, as far as security background checks and those type of things. Customs and Border Protection aren't only looking at the individual FTZ locations within our building, but looking at our total facility from a standpoint of security and um, uh, their 
not constantly, but periodically trying to breach that security and test us for that, that accuracy. The other thing that's important too is because all these materials that you bring into an FTZ are outside the U.S. Customs. Uh, the inventory accuracy has to be much, much higher and is monitored at a much higher level. So if you have products that are, are high value or are worried about high security, the FTZ is, is a, uh, a very good choice for your products because, again, you've got uh, a very high interest from the Customs and Border Patrol to make sure that it, those inventory counts are accurate and they're done on, a, on an annual basis for an annual report. So that's also a big benefit for so I, I agree with, with all those. Um, security is definitely um, a big issue, inventory control. I, I kind of want to just touch a little bit of, uh, upon, I think, just controls in general, understanding the business process and the flow and being on top of your business because businesses change quite rapidly. And so you set something up yesterday and you think you're great. You have to be on top and keep checking back with your businesses, all your stakeholders, um, because they will change their process and you need to be one step ahead of them to make sure you're staying compliant. So I, I kind of something that we do, we do a checklist, and so we just kind of periodically check all the different stakeholders um, that are involved with the FTZ and just kind of check in on them and say, okay, what are you doing? What's your process? Anything changed? Oh, you're thinking about this. Okay, let's loop us in. Um, I feel like that's one of the challenges is staying connected with your company and the business and the assets ever changing. Thank you. How do you educate your uh, workforce about the foreign trade zone and the responsibility um, of operating as an, as an FTZ to stay compliant? Uh, well, that's a good question. How do you do that, Rich? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, I mean, there are certain uh, procedures you have to go through in order to uh, make sure that the staff is properly trained. Uh, it does help that Customs walks through there at least once a year, fully armed with the with the uniform. It kind of impresses the significance upon the employees. Uh, <clears throat> But I think it gets back to what Shannon was saying earlier, was uh, understand your business, make sure you're on top of your processes and procedures, make sure everything's documented, make sure you know what's going on in your own warehouse, and uh, just staying on top of things day to day. In all of our processes, we're ISO certified, and so we do that across our organization. Without that piece, it would be much more difficult to maintain that uh, process uh, control and, docu if, um, and discipline if we didn't have the ISO certification part of it as well. So for Tesla, we are a very big company. We're, we're, we're growing and we're getting more and more employees. And so training and outreach uh, of the employees is difficult and it's hard to reach every single Tesla employee. And so our strategy has been to do a, a level up. And so we have a great um, relationship with our security team and we fully educate them on what a foreign trade zone mean. Uh, and with them through the training, our, our expectation is for them to train the rest of their um, security um, personnels around the factory and the teams and we do more of like a spot audit so we will audit our security and ensure that they're doing the request that we ask them to for securing the facility we do the same thing from an inventory control stance point we have a point of contact who owns um, the FTZ inventory uh, control aspect and we meet with that point of contact on a regular basis and we train that individual all of the FTZ regulations so when she's working with her daily groups, she can educate all of her stakeholders to ensure the processes are being followed. And so I, I feel as much as Anthony and I can go out there on our foot and audit and look, it's a big facility. And so we really felt like we needed to build those partnerships within Tesla to stress the importance um, and get upper management buy-in, like um, that the foreign trade zone is a benefit. Um, it's a privilege, not a right, to be a part of the foreign trade zone and that any time we could lose that privilege and if we want to maintain it uh, we need to follow the regulations and by getting that upper management support I feel like it trickles down uh, and it alleviates us from hitting every single group which would be almost an impossible task for us to do. Thank you. Um, the final question that I have is if ask if you could provide insight to companies on that might be considering a foreign trade zone, what are the key issues that the company should consider um, when evaluating the program and whether they should proceed with an application? How do they determine the economic benefit uh, and also what type of investment is required on the part of a company that's going to be operating a foreign trade zone? 
Let me try to kind of parse that into two different, well, I'll let Shannon ask, answer the tough question, which how do I take a, a big manufacturing site and kind of just kind of explain what, what we do at RKA Logistics and also what San Jose Distribution Services did in the past is we're a third party logistics provider. So when you use us, you can use the, get the benefits of a, an FDZ without going through all of these processes yourself. And so when you have manufacturing import export issues, um, we can take, a, you know, really stand between you and the, the uh, Joe's uh, organization and do those that work for you. So what kind of things can, can happen that would cause you to uh, uh, want to use an FTZ? Well, if you import a lot of products, you have a lot of different uh, shipments coming in from all over the world all the time. So maybe that weekly entry is a big benefit for you. Rather than pay your custom broker for every entry, you can just pay them once a week and save a lot of money on customs entry processes. Um, where we get a lot of interest is, is companies that have a, some component of their, of their manufacturing process that has a high tariff rate where you can take advantage of changing that harmonized code. A good example is batteries. We work with electric motorcycle manufacturers, electric skateboard manufacturers, electric car manufacturers, where batteries have a high tariff relative to the final finished good. And there's other products like that. So we can do that manufacturing work within our the FTZ, and you can take it, if you get approval from the Foreign uh, Trade Zone Board, they can allow you to bring that, that product in at a cheaper rate. The other thing we're getting a lot of questions about right now is with all the tariff changes and, and that's going to take taking place right now, and you're, they're seeing your tariff rates change. Um, a lot of it's about timing now, so products used to be able to bring in at a low t tariff rate. People now want to keep outside of the, um, if you will, the U.S. Commerce especially if they're going through uh, a spare ports organization, because those hard, a lot of those high tariff items may come into your, the FTZ, and a lot of that may be turned around and exported uh, back out to your, to your um, sites where they're using ports, uh, parts overseas. So again, a spare parts organization where tariff rates are increasing. Um, and there's also that people are trying to time things. So they're saying, well, I know especially with working with the Port of Oakland, I have a lot of product coming in that's shoved it to a high tariff rate that may only be in effect for a short period of time as these trade negotiations ebb and flow. So they want to bring that product in and pay that higher duty, but they may be buying six months worth of inventory where some of that inventory may be subject to a lower tariff rate in the future. So uh, those are some of the things we're getting a lot of inquiries about right now. The other thing about, think about an FTZ, especially a general purpose FTZ, it's really just a link in your supply chain. But if you don't have it set up ahead of time, to be able to implement it, then it, the, the, these delays um, prohibit you from taking advantage of the opportunities. So if you think this may fit into your supply chain, it's better to get the processes defined up front, and then you can kind of deploy it out of kind of a, if this happens, then I'll use the FTZ type of mentality. But you don't want to do it yourself. And that's kind of what we do. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of a, a tough question, because there there's a, a lot of things. Um, of starting an FTZ that there's challenges. And, and I actually think there's there's some things that are very straightforward that is time consuming, but under, doing a feasibility test, I think is fairly straightforward. You look at your component, you look at what you wanna do and understand uh, just running the material through a foreign trade zone saves me money. And then you have to look at how much does it gonna cost me to implement a foreign trade zone. You have to hire an FTZ administrator, you gotta hire, uh, buy your software system integration. Uh, you probably might hire a consultant to help you set up your foreign trade zone, and they're all cost associated. So th completing the, the feasibility test is really the first step you need to do into deciding whether or not an FTZ would work for my company. After you complete the feasibility test, then you kind of have two different paths, and you have the one working with the Foreign Trade Zone Board, making sure you have your application for FTZ designation in place, if you're gonna do manufacturing, your production notification. And while yes, the application is very straightforward, understanding the bill of material and what goes into it can be quite a challenge. Um, and then you're also going to start the activation process. Um, reach out to your local CBP officers, um, share them what you want to do, what you want to accomplish with your foreign trade zone. Um, in my experience, uh, CBP officers have been always willing to work with you, understand your process and what needs to get done. And then even, and I tie this in with the activation, and it's not quite uh, like an activation process, it's really, I, what I call it um, is a system integration with your software. So when you're doing manufacturing, it, it's almost really hard to do it in a manual environment. You need to go down um, an automated solution with a software company. And there's multiple software providers for um, FTZ. 
And so you, you go through that process, you choose your FTZ software provider, and then you start the implementation process with them. And that's where I feel like it gets very difficult because you think, okay, I'm all set. I, I understand all these things. I know my process. And then you start mapping the actual data requirements that you need to receive a product into your foreign trade zone, all the data requirements to track the goods from admission to withdraw, and, and then what you need to do, the data elements to withdraw the product from your foreign trade zone. And you'd be surprised at how many system gaps that you're finding. And then comes the real hard work to uh, closing all those system gaps um, to get your FTZ up and running. So I think from, from my perspective, the hardest challenge has been really doing that system integration with our FTZ software um, to have all the data that's required to run a foreign trade zone. Thank you very much for your insight. I would like to provide you uh, the opportunity to ask questions of our panel members. We do have one additional speaker following uh, this, but um, while we have our speakers from the operators uh, on the dais, I would like to provide you with the opportunity to ask questions. So does anyone have questions? Sure. Uh, in the news, there's been a little bit about uh, tariffs on Chinese products. Uh, how, do, how does that uh, factor into this? I guess I could, if you want to answer, I, I could jump to Tesla's perspective and then you can answer. Yeah, I can answer. Yeah. yeah so, so from a business sector, we, we're feeling the impact of the tariffs in. So everybody's looking at the cost of, you know, how to lower the cost of your finished good. And having higher duty rates is not helping the situation. And so one of the things that Tesla has looked into is running the product um, uh, for Section 301 and 232 to run it through the zone, we would have to admit it into the FTZ in privileged status. So it's locking in that high duty rate. So when we admit the car into US commerce, we're still paying that high duty rate on that foreign component. But it helps Tesla in the standpoint that we're about a 50-50 net exporter. And so every car that we export in bond out of our foreign trade zone, uh, we wouldn't have to pay duty on any of the components in the car. So it's a cash flow savings for Tesla. Yeah, from our standpoint, it's created a lot more interest in the FTC, that's for sure. Um, and again, the people that understand their business and how these, these tariffs are going to impact their business are much further ahead. So again, I think if you, if you understand your import-export strategy and, and what tariffs may be coming in place and have a, a like I said, a, an FTZ strategy that if, if this happens, then I'll, I'll deploy that strategy ahead of time, then you can act quickly. Most people coming to us now don't have that in place. And so, um, well, it's going to take some time to get those, those procedures and policies in place this time. They may miss this gap, but they'll be available for it next time. So this is kind of a forward-looking opportunity, especially if we're going to use a general purpose zone. still duty savings because you never file the customs entry. But anything that comes into the U.S. market that's subject to the 301, even from a foreign trade zone, even if it's been manufactured, you will need to pay the 301 duties. So yeah, great job, but yeah. just to reinforce. <laughs> Hi. Um, it seems like a lot of current uh, people are much bigger companies. I'm just wondering if there's any guidelines in terms of what size the company gets up to that they should start thinking about um, utilizing the FTC you know, benefits? I think from our perspective, in a general purpose zone, you can be very small. We've had some very small in, uh, inquiries of, from companies that are doing uh, very small uh, manufacturing opportunities. Um, for example, we have startup companies that are putting batteries into a skateboard. Um, uh, again, by, by taking advantage of the harmonized code opportunity, doing it in a general purpose zone, you don't have to be very big at all. Um, we got into the FTC business and we had about 50 employees. We were a very small company. I did the application myself with Joe's help. It took me about a couple of weeks to pull all the data together. So it's not a very hard process from an application standpoint to get, to get done. And the FTZ board is very helpful. So it's, it's not a size issue. It's more of an opportunity issue. So if you, like Sam said, do a, do a, a feasibility study. Um, the fees from Joe's perspective are very low. Uh, we can get, get on board for less than $5,000. Your annual fee is $300. You don't need a lot of savings to save $300 a year. Um, and the software is a little bit of an issue, but again, the smaller your company, the, more, the less complex 
your, your uh, manufacturing process, the less problems you have about software costs. So yeah, trying to manage Tesla versus trying to manage, you know, putting a battery in a skateboard is, is a little different uh, cost, you know, from a software standpoint too. Then, then, uh, sorry, less about the size of your company than really how well, how familiar are you with your operations and how under control are your operations? Because uh, depending on the complexity, again, uh, that's really going to determine the costs. And if you have great inventory control system and you're running just one or two products, uh, you know, it could be a very simple thing to manage and to, and to get on board. So really, it, it's not so much about the size, it's about the complexity of the operations and how good are your existing controls. Um, but a lot of the work you can do internally. For the activation process, you might want to talk to somebody. Um, but again, talk to CBP first. Find out how much work you would need to do uh, to get up to the level that they are comfortable with. Any other questions? Okay. Um, do you also activate the FTZ in the research and development area or engineering development area? So for Tesla, no, we decided strategically not to activate R&D, and, and I'll give you the reasonings why. Um, what we really, because we need to have the accurate, accurate inventory control, we're bringing in production parts, parts that we've already vetted, that are coming in on a regular basis, um, that we know everything about, no surprises. Um, R&D engineers um, have a tendency to bring in new widgets, new product at any time, and then they also have a tendency to want to take it home with them or do something like that. And so it's just really hard to manage engineers. It's easier just to stick with your production. Um, that, that's been my experience. I will answer, I mean, Malcolm's not here from uh, Lamb Research, but they do put their R&D under the uh, FTZ and we help manage that. So. Again, the policies and procedures have to be in place to make sure that those new parts come in, get registered. They, uh, we have to have bonded trucks that move those over to their R&D facility. We have to make sure that the engineers don't take those parts outside of the engineered facility. And when they take all those parts and put them together and make a new thing that they, that they store for 10 years for some reason, we have to have a bonded <laughs> FTZ location to store that, that uh, creation that they make that, that may not even turn into a manufactured facility. But yeah, they can, they can do it. Lamb has taken that, that decision to put R&D inside it. For Tesla, is your zone the exterior perimeter fence, your building, or your certain areas within the building? Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, electric vehicles, they have wheels, and so they go inside and out. And, and I didn't mean to be uh, sarcastic on that because my previous job was the four walls of a building. I was very familiar with working and you know, coming from um, electronics, you know, the four walls of the building was what was activated and move in. And it was kind of a shock for me when I w went to Tesla and our, you know, exterior, our outbound logistics yard is activated. Um, but it makes sense because vehicles go inside and out. We um, worked with the um, CBP officers at, to secure the outside perimeter of our factory, and we have eight feet barbed wire and then two feet. Um, I'm sorry, eight feet. Eight feet fence. Eight. Well, eight feet fence, two feet barbed wire. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have my fencing down. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so we, we worked on securing the outside of our facility along with our whole production line, which is makes up the predominantly the complete building interior. Any final questions? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Hey, um, I was wondering how much of this stuff that we're learning about the San Jose uh, free, uh, foreign trade zone, does that apply to the other 250 uh, foreign trade zones in the United States. What are, like, are they all different? Um, you know, does this relationship between the grantees and operators work the same way, et cetera? Better take this to make sure you can hear me. Um, so basically the structure is the same. Anywhere you go in the country uh, as a company, you'll need to work with the local grantee. And again, most over 250 zones, um, most custom sports of entry have a grantee and an FTZ associated with them. And if there's not one right at that port of entry or right where you're located, there should be one nearby that can help you out. So that structure is the same. Of the zones that have activity, the vast majority now are under this alternative site framework. 
and can do these quick and simple designations. So the vast majority of requests that, that our office receives for new designations for company come through this system, this quick and simple 30-day process. So there are some locations in the country that are just too far uh, from a CBP port of entry, and we have to do the, the, the longer subzone process. But, but again, it's about three or five months, um, so it's, it's doable. <laughs> and, and you can be working on your activation in that time period. Um, but most places in this country, uh, most zones have reorganized under this framework and at least have some area around the port of entry that is available for this quick and simple designation. Thank you, Liz, and thank you, Anthony, Shannon, Rock, and Rich. Uh, please give them a round of applause. Um, there will be an opportunity to ask additional questions following our final speaker, but I did want to introduce our final speaker who um, has great expertise on international trade policy, and I know that several of you have asked questions about current trade policy uh, issues uh, facing the nation. Uh, so we're very pleased to welcome John McKenzie, a partner at the law firm of Baker & McKenzie in San Francisco. Uh, John joined Baker & McKenzie in 1976 and has worked at the offices, uh, the firm's offices in Caracas and Taipei in addition to San Francisco. Uh, he has extensive cross-border transaction and international trade regulation experience, uh, including export controls, economic sanctions regulations, customs and import regulation. And for the past 35 years, John has been the lead organizer and chaired uh, Baker and McKenzie's annual um, Import-Export Conference, which is the leading uh, conference of its type on the West Coast. And uh, we're thrilled to have him here in San Jose today. He's a graduate of Williams College and also Harvard Law School. So with that, well, thank you. John. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to be here. <clears throat> and Joe, thank you very much for your invitation. <clears throat> I really appreciate the very kind applause when Joe introduced me because people seldom applaud after a lawyer has said something to say. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> As Joe indicated, I've been in the international trade area for a long period of time. And I think when I started in this legal practice, it was a fairly obscure area. There were a limited number of people as well as people in the trade community, and the government community, and so forth involved in it. And many of my schoolmates said, oh, you do international trade. That sounds cute. What do you do? Um, especially here in Silicon Valley. And it is, in, in, in fact, really important that we've gone through a dramatic, almost a sea change in terms of the focus on trade here in Silicon Valley, which is why I think that this program that Joe's very kindly put on is so timely. For many of the companies represented here in the Valley, up until the last year or so, their products, or a good deal of the products that they imported into the United States were duty free. And for people, especially in the finance and um, tax aspects of many of the companies here, trade and customs duties were frankly something of an afterthought. And, and indeed, within many of the companies, the people who focused on this were the trade professionals, perhaps some of the people in the legal group, but for many companies, it wasn't a dollar and cents issue. Now, this has changed really dramatically, as many of you know, with both the rather substantial de decrease in the basic income tax rate, which was the big dog in this area, and at the same time, increases in duties on many products, especially coming from China under Section 301, and some of the products imported under Section 232, um, which now attract duties at 10 or 25 percent, making duties for the first time for many of these companies here in Silicon Valley very much a revenue issue. And indeed, uh, that seems to become an increasing focus, at least of what I've been doing. Um, it is certainly the case that over the last year, 
a very significant portion of what I've been doing, and I think others working in this area as well, been looking at possible strategies and working with companies in possible strategies to mitigate the effects of these increased duties that the government has imposed. And that's why I think this program is extremely important. And as I'll talk about in a couple of moments, the FTZs are one of the critical elements of that mitigation strategy for many companies. For those of you who might be interested generally in strategies, and I think one of the gentlemen asked questions about this a few moments ago, I do have a paper which I'd be happy to share with people who are interested in the several different strategies under the laws and regulations implemented by CBP and the orders coming out imposing these 301 and 232 duties on how one size, of course, doesn't fit all, but how companies can look at different types of arrangements to mitigate the effects of these duties. But let's talk a little bit about this in the context of FTZs. We'll linger on this. Ms. Whiteman gave a very um, uh, uh, excellent presentation on the, an overview of the FTZs. But just to give a little bit of background as I put on this chart, the fundamental point as Ms. Whiteman explained, is really to encourage economic activity and operations in the United States with concomitant employment and business activities that might otherwise be done outside of the United States based on the, the imposition of customs duties on imported merchandise. Again, in Silicon Valley, it wasn't a key issue for many companies. All of a sudden, it has become a very big issue indeed. And at the last point, various types of activities, again, Ms. Whiteman described them much more eloquently than I, the types of activities that can be conducted in an FTZ subject to, for example, in the case of manufacturing, to specific approval from the Foreign Trade Zone Board. Now, the kinds of benefits, again, we've talked a good deal about this, the fundamental one being the cost savings either for duty deferral in terms of bringing merchandise into the FTC and deferring the time of entry and the payment of duties if duties are applicable. And that would apply to normal customs duties. It would also apply to these extraordinary duties that we've seen imposed under these special trade measures over the last year. Similarly, and, and this is, I think, one of the real attractions of the zone here, many of the companies that I know around here may use the United States as essentially a distribution point for their merchandise throughout the Americas, or perhaps even throughout the world. So product may be manufactured by a manufacturer in Asia, particularly in China in the 301 context, brought into the United States, the company may break bulk and then distribute the product out to other foreign locations. With the use of an FTZ, critical benefit is the ability to avoid the imposition of duties uh, upon that merchandise while it's in the United States with the break bulk storage and then outbound shipment. Now, people will come to me who are knowledgeable in this area and say, well, what's the benefit of using an FTZ when I can simply claim duty drawback? Well, there are several, uh, several benefits of the FTZ. One, those who know drawback know that you recover 99%, not 100%, of the duties that you've paid. And secondly, there's a key cash flow issue. The cash flow issue being that if you're bringing merchandise into the customs territory of the United States, you pay the duties, and then you go through the process of claiming drawback um, when the goods are subsequently exported, whereas you don't have that cash flow problem if the goods are in the FTZ. There's also a timing issue, especially for those who may be working with same condition or unused merchandise drawback in the sense that the merchandise must be exported within three years in order to claim duty drawback. There's no limitation, as Ms. Whiteman explained, on the time that merchandise can be stored in an FTZ before it's ex exported on outbound basis. One of the other areas that I do want to point out that I don't think we talked a lot about um, uh, a few moments ago in the several presentations is this last bullet. Um, those of you who may be, have companies that sell to the United States government may be familiar with the Buy American program and its waivers under the so-called Trade Agreements Act for products that have been deemed to have been substantially transformed either in the USA 
or in one of the eligible countries with which we either have a free trade agreement or that is a party to the World Trade Organization's agreement on government procurement. FTZ offers the possibility of bringing in imported parts and components from countries that are not eligible TAA countries, doing the manufacturing, again, subject to approval by the Foreign Trade Zone Board, doing the manufacturing production, as I think you described it, Liz, um, in the Foreign Trade Zone, such that it constitutes a substantial transformation of that product, converting it effectively into a U.S.-made end product eligible for procurement by U.S. government agencies under the Trade Agreements Act. Now, we talked a little bit about, and, and some of those of you who are casual readers of the newspapers may have heard about a few trade disputes. One of, these, one of the gentlemen asking a question referred to that. And we've seen with this administration in particular a number of initiatives attempting to rebalance, if you will, or readjust U.S. trade with various other countries of the world, invoking various programs under our trade and customs laws. The first of these major developments, under Section 232 of the Trade Enhancement Act of 1962, one of the more obscure of our trade laws, a provision which authorizes the administration to adjust trade in the form of the imposition of duties if deemed to be necessary to facilitate or protect the national security of the United States. And why that's particularly important is there is an exemption from the World Trade Organization's um, provisions about equitable treatment and non-discrimination where it's necessary to protect, necessary to protect the national security of a member country. So earlier, or I should say in to early 2018, the government imposed these duties on imported steel and aluminum products based on findings that these that steel and aluminum were essential to U.S. national security. And this applies very broadly to products imported from almost every country of the world. There are some exemptions for a very limited handful of countries. Now, why is a foreign trade zone important in this particular context? If I am important, well, first of all, the critical thing, and we've talked about that, in particular, if I'm importing products that are subject to the 232, de uh, 232 duties, if I bring them into a foreign trade zone, I can then defer the duties on, those, um, on, on that steel or those aluminum products until they're entered for consumption into the United States. As Lynn in Liz indicated in her presentation, the duties are locked in. The term of art used in the regulations is privileged foreign status. So if I subsequently bring in those steel or aluminum products into the United States, either as originally imported into the FTZ or as manufactured into a manufactured product, they become dutiable and dutiable at the 301 rate, 25% or 10% as the case may be. But at least I have the benefit there of duty deferral. More importantly, perhaps, if I'm bringing in the product and subsequently exporting them, I do not incur the duties. Simply, they reside, the goods reside in, and are stored in the FTZ and then export, subsequently exported. No duties are incurred. And in this context in particular, that mechanism of using the FTZ is particularly important because drawback is not available for the, three, the 232 duties applicable to aluminum and steel. And for those of you who may, like our friends from Tesla, be involved in the auto industry as kind of a distant early warning to keep in mind, the Commerce Department uh, back, I guess, two weeks ago reported to the president, supposedly, it's not public, but supposedly recommending 232 duties on autos and auto parts as well. So we may be seeing that coming down the path. The president has 90 days to make a determination as to whether to impose those duties. We would imagine that if he does, it'll be the same structure. So again, the FTC, particularly important, 
because imported auto parts that are brought into the U.S. and then subsequently exported would not be eligible for duty drawback if the model holds, which it almost certainly will, the model that was implemented for the steel and aluminum tariffs. Now, again, we may have heard a little bit about a trade dispute with China. And a little bit, and this is all under the rubric of Section 301 of the Trade Enhancement Act of 1974. Uh, basically, that statute authorizes the president through the U.S. Trade Representative to take retaliatory measures, as they're described, against countries that discriminate against U.S. trade and impose an unfair burden in, on, on U.S. trade. In that context, the U.S. Trade Representative found a series of trade practices implemented um, by the government of, the, of China to be unfair and discriminatory against U.S. products, involving forced technology transfer, restricting the ability of technology licensors to negotiate with their Chinese partners on market arm's length terms. Um, when you're negotiating a technology license, in China, the perception is you're not just negotiating with your partner, but also there's a third party in that act, the Chinese government. Concerns about China's policies in encouraging or facilitating or indeed subsidizing acquisitions of U.S. companies in order to secure technology, leading edge technologies being developed by those companies, and then the whole area of, the whole area of cyber espionage. So based on those findings, the U.S. Trade Representative recommended and the President implemented the imposition of these retaliatory tariffs on imported Chinese merchandise. And we've gone through three rounds in July, in August, and September of imposing these um, uh, 301 duties, first on about $34 billion worth of Chinese products, then another $16 billion worth of Chinese products, and then in September, another $200 billion worth of Chinese products. The first two rounds at 25%. The third round initially at 10%, with the original projection being that those would ratchet up to 25% in, uh, on the 1st of January of this year. That was deferred ostensibly till last Saturday, at the end of last week, the USTR has basically said that the ratchet up, or the upward ratchet, will be deferred indefinitely pending what the government at least hopes will be a more comprehensive resolution of some of the trade issues with China. That kind of goes like a sine wave if you read the newspapers. Today, everybody's optimistic and the, stick, and the, the stock market goes up. Tomorrow, people are not so optimistic and the stock market goes down. Um, Delegations go back and forth from the U.S. to China. We're close. We're close. So we'll see how that uh, how that actually does, in fact, work out, and whether it will be comprehensive or more in the nature of a continuation of standstill, with some nibbling away at the edges. Um, uh, remain, really remains to be seen. But in the meantime, we've got the situation where there are these very substantial duties applicable to imported Chinese products, $250 billion worth of Chinese products. And again, if the company is staging its global distribution in the United States, the FTC can be a very attractive mechanism to completely avoid those duties and avoid having to go through the regulatory aspects of paying duties, then claiming drawback after the fact. Similarly, if the company is importing the product either for storage and then subsequent distribution into the USA or for manufacturing into finished products which will be sold and distributed in the United States, the attractiveness of the FTC as a duty deferral mechanism, the duties don't go away, unfortunately, but in fact they um, would be deferred until such time as they're absolutely needed for example, a just-in-time manufacturing model or something like that, while the goods are stored in the FTC. So those are really the points that I wanted to emphasize. I think we're very fortunate here in this environment that we have a number of highly experienced people, many, several of whom have come to share their expertise uh, with us today, who, from, from government agencies, from 
the FTC, from CBP, from the U.S. Commercial Service, of course, Joe here in the city of San Jose, that we're the terrific resources that can help all of us and our companies in dealing and confronting with these trade issues that seem to loom larger and larger as time goes by. I'd just like to close with one little vignette that explains in part how I got involved in this. Years ago, um, we had very strict sugar quotas here in the United States, and it was as a result of our sugar quotas, um, the, world, the price of sugar in the United States was about five or six times what it is in, in the world market. And um, read about this wonderful situation where somebody set up an operation in a foreign trade zone up near the Canadian border, bringing in bags of sugar and bags of flour in the FTZ, mixing them together, entering them not as sugar as cake, but as cake mix. They would come along a little conveyor belt, then there'd be a sieve. The sugar would drop down after it came into the customs territory of the United States. The conveyor belt would go around again with the sugar, or with the flour, I should say, to be remixed in the next round of sugar. Well, CBP saw through that one pretty easily and said, no, no, no. But I was charmed about reading about that, and that said, well, this has got to be a fun thing to be involved in. So thank you all very much. I appreciate the chance to be with you. Thank you, Joe. I'm happy to stay around and answer questions if anybody has them. Yes, thank you very much, John, and uh, thank you for sharing your expertise on very important contemporary trade issues. Um, at this point, I would like to invite you to ask questions of Joanne and John and Liz and, and, and also um, the panel members. So we'll open up the floor. Also, I would like to remind you that there is a sign-up sheet available to meet with Liz and also Joanne from the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, following this. Um, and also throughout the afternoon, we've reserved a room in City Hall for those meetings to take place. Um, also um, wanted to remind people that we do have a parking validation machine in the back. So if you parked in the underground City Hall garage or you parked in the 4th Street garage, we can validate your parking. Um, and apparently someone did drop their uh, parking uh, ticket. So I do have a, a parking ticket, for, uh, um, but we want to make sure that everyone receives their parking validation so you're not required to, to pay uh, for attending this uh, session. So with that, I would like to open up the floor for questions. Yes. Hi. Uh, I have a kind of macro level question. Uh, on Thursday, the Newsom administration announced a uh, Committee on International Affairs and Trade Development. And this might be speculative, but I'm just wondering what the impact of that might be to existing trade promotion initiatives. And I would add that um, there's a very important role for the state of California in international trade and promoting a, a positive business environment to attract foreign investment and to help companies um, grow internationally. So uh, each of the uh, past administrations has had a very, vo a very robust uh, international trade program. And in the past, uh, the state of California at one time had a number of international trade offices located throughout the world to help businesses. And many of those uh, state programs also uh, partnered with local municipal governments and also uh, partnered with uh, the federal government, um, Joanne's agency, for example. So, other questions? I just wanted to. Uh say a, a positive statement that happened while I was uh, walking uh, through the, you know, learning the process. Uh, I'm from Bloom Energy, I work with Darren, and uh, been working with RK on learning the FTZ. 
And one thing that I, I, you know, when I first started learning about FTZ is, you know, okay, I gotta do procedures, I gotta learn things, I gotta monitor things, it's a lot of work, right? But one thing, uh, Officer, Officer Lee's team and the other officers, they actually gave me some information that made it a positive experience. And that's that, that what it's for. And that's to create jobs, to entice us to want to make things, build them here and create the jobs here in the US. And I started looking at it and, and, and with our company, we're bringing in materials from everywhere, putting them together here in the US, making jobs in Sunnyvale and Delaware for our company, and then shipping those products out to Korea. We have customers and it's great if we could find even more parts of our process that we could bring in to create even more jobs. It was very, and it was their team that said, yeah, we wanna make it easy on you so you can do this, so we can have more jobs. And I thought, wow, that made me think about it completely different and not so like pain in the butt doing all this paperwork or tracking, right? <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And I would add that Bloom's uh, foreign trade zone is um, somewhat unique in that um, they applied for foreign trade zone authority here in California. And at the same time, they submitted an, an application for their site in the state of Delaware. So they have uh, two zones, uh, different grantees and different uh, customs and border protection and, uh, staff working with them. Uh, but they're going to be able to do zone to zone transfers. And so they're going to be able to transfer materials from California to Delaware and from Delaware to California um, uh, on a zone to zone basis without uh, you know, entering US customs territory. So, um, you know, we're thrilled that Bloom is our newest uh, foreign trade zone operator here at foreign trade zone number 18. So thank you for that. Other questions or comments? Well, if there's no more questions, what we'll do is we'll end this formal part of the program, but you're welcome to stay around and network and talk individually with um, each of our presenters or anyone that you've met here and certainly with uh, uh, our friends from U.S. Customs and Border Protection. We're particularly pleased that uh, 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 Officer Lee and, uh, and her colleagues are joining uh, with us today. Uh, and as you heard, they're very valuable uh, partners in the FTZ program. So thank you for taking time to come to City Hall.